Hi, everyone. Thanks again for coming to this webinar. My name is Lou Deloisey. I am a PhD student in Danielle Oreck's lab at Montana State University. I'm co-organizing this webinar with Laurel Sindwald, who is a recent PhD graduate from Diana Tombach's Forest Ecology Lab at CU, and Enzo Martelli Moya, also a PhD student in Karen Nelson's lab at the University of Montana. If you missed any of our previous installments of this webinar, you can find the recordings of the talks on our YouTube channel, and the link for that and our website is now in the chat, so you can go to there. Um, so it is now my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Stephen Heisman, who is a master's student in forest ecology at Montana State University in Bozeman, Montana. He has worked as a field botanist with the Bureau of Land Management in Central Oregon and as a threatened shorebird monitor with the National Park Service at Gateway National Recreation Area in Brooklyn, New York. In addition to that, he is also an open source computing enthusiast with a professional background in high performance computing and Linux systems administration. Stephen hopes to one day apply his fascination with plants and technology to tackle big data problems to help conserve species like whitebark pine. If anyone has any questions for Stephen, please type them into the chat or wait and virtually raise your hand at the end of Stephen's talk so that Enzo can enable you to use your microphone. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Stephen. Great, thanks Lou. And uh, thanks everybody else on the, the White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation webinar team for inviting me to give this talk. It's really an honor. Uh, I'm a master's student at Montana State University. Uh, and my research involves modeling climate refugia for white bark pine into the future, which we hope to use to identify ideal planning locations to efficiently use seedling resources. Um, and with that, I'll share my screen. So yeah, I hope to I hope to give you a little overview of my research and what I'm working on for my master's thesis and the various components and basis for it. I'd like to start with some thank yous. First of all, I'd like to thank my advisors, Drs. Daniel Ulrich and Brian Smithers from Montana State University, and David Toma from the National Park Service. I'm really lucky to have a, a very supportive advising team, and they uh, really help me out with a lot of complex issues that I have. I'd also like to thank Mike Tursik, who's a collaborator on this project and is responsible for creating the, the gridded water balance projections that really make this project possible. I'd like to thank Aaron Shanahan and the INM monitoring crews for collecting the field data that we've used for a lot of this research, and also without which none of this would be possible. Uh, EJ really kicked off the, the white pine blister rust modeling effort that I'm gonna show off in this presentation and really got me close to the finish line and I'm just carrying it over. She's really responsible for a lot of it. I'd like to thank the RCI team at Montana State University for providing computing resources, such as the Tempest Research Cluster that make a lot of the really heavy computational efforts that I need to do to work with these large data sets possible. And finally, I'd like to thank the National Park Service for providing funding for this project through the focused condition assessment. And they really, are the reason all this is happening. So rising temperatures and drought have already resulted in widespread forest mortality throughout the world. And white bark pine has previously been sheltered from a lot of the effects of climate due to its location in high elevations and presence of cold temperatures. However, it is increasingly at risk from climate-driven disturbances, including wildfire, drought, mountain pine beetle, and white pine blister rust. And losses of white bark pine recently led to it being listed as a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act by the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. Conservation efforts for white bark pine have mostly focused on planting wasp resistant seedlings and often recently burned stands are selected for these planting locations. And historically, fires shape white bark pine landscapes, and recently burned stands are, are where trees have grown well due to release from competition and increased sunlight that allows seedlings to establish quickly and gain a foothold on the landscape. 
And to support this fact, stands that are affected by fire often where Clark's nutcracker will cache the seeds and, and are one of the major drivers of natural white bark pine regeneration. And under a stable climate, planting in recently burned areas, areas is well warranted. Um, but this may not be true in a changing climate. Areas that burn today may continue to get hotter and drier into the future and may be even more likely to burn in the future, which could wipe out planted seedlings and, and make uh, many efforts for not. My research is driven by the goal of mapping out climate refugia in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem for white bark pine now and into the future. And climate refugia are areas of relatively stable climate, which are decoupled from the regional climate, where climate sensitive species can survive when the regional climate becomes unfavorable. And there's a lot of historical evidence that these in the past have allowed climate sensitive species to survive through periods of rapidly changing climate. And our main goal with these climate refugia is to identify optimal locations to outplant blister rust resistant seedlings uh, where they'll have the highest probability of survival into the reproductive age. Uh, in order to do that, they'll need to escape various disturbance agents and also have a climate conducive for their establishment and growth. Uh, but we'd also, we also hope that these maps will help identify locations of high value stands that are likely to persist into the future where um, conservation efforts can be focused to, to ensure that they survive and thrive on the landscape. And we also hope to identify locations where existing stands may become threatened by climate driven disturbance in the future, where we can also target mitigation efforts and try to change the course of things. And so our approach for this is to create a series of layers that describe the climate vulnerabilities to white bark pine uh, at, at various critical life stages. Um, and we hope to essentially overlay these layers and the union of suitable areas will identify climate refugia where it's where white bark pine is likely to survive and thrive into the future. And our right now we have six players are trying to incorporate into this project. We're looking at areas where the climate is conducive for seedling establishment, where the climate is likely to avoid severe drought uh, and wildfire, where uh, the climate is going to minimize the possibility of mountain pine beetle infestation and white pine blister rust infection. And this final one is a very much a work in progress, but we're hoping to identify the climate drivers of cone production, which will allow us to identify particularly productive areas of the landscape to establish seed orchards that will allow Clark's nutcracker to further spread rust resistant genes across the landscape. And this research, has, these research questions have been asked by many people. Uh, in many ways, this work is not new. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge some of the, some of the people who have paved the, the path for this to happen. Um, Tony Chang in his PhD work at Montana State University identified, uh, developed a species distribution model of white bark pine in the GYE and used that model to develop projections of ideal or even, or less suitable habitat in the GYE. And he found some rather unfortunate findings with his model. He, he saw a really great reduction in suitable and ideal habitat for white bark pine across the GYE and a reduction of the suitable habitat, mainly to high elevation areas in the, in the greater ecosystem. And Catherine Ireland built on Tony Chang's work and used his, his SDMs to make climate informed management recommendations, including on planning, which is a very similar question to what we we're trying to answer. Um, however, she identified some areas for improvement in her um, in the end of her paper. Uh, specifically, she noted the lack of spatially explicit projections of climate change impacts on things that we are trying to model here, such as white pine blister rust, fire, or beetles. Um, so I'm really hoping that by developing these projections for these layers that were not available uh, when work was previously done to answer similar questions, that we will uh, be able to identify more accurate uh, projections of white bark pines future in the landscape and hopefully identify areas where it might survive that other work has not identified. So white bark pine seedlings take an extremely long time to establish on the landscape, at least on a human scale. It can take upwards of half a century or longer for a seedling that's planted today to begin to bear cones, which is when we can really consider a restoration effort a success by our metrics. 
So it's really in our interest to target areas to plant white bark pine seedlings where they're going to establish as, as rapidly as possible. And water balance researchers have found that vegetation growth is often highly correlated with a measure called actual evapotranspiration. And what AT measures is the magnitude and length of growing conditions favorable to plants. It accounts for the simultaneous availability of energy and water. And when AET is positive, it means that the plants are likely grown. And this correlation also holds with white bark pine. Studies of white bark pine seedlings, such as David Laufenberg's work, who was also a master student at MSU, found that white bark pine seedling growth rates were highly correlated with actual evapotranspiration. And using work like this, we can identify thresholds of AET where we can target areas of landscape that are likely to be very productive for white bark pine seedlings and where they will establish quickly uh, um, once planted. And on this curve, you can see that uh, seedling growth rates typically really take off around 350 millimeters of growing season accumulated AET. However, this is a really restrictive uh, measure to use for planting white bark as it will eliminate a lot of areas that would be suitable for the habitat otherwise. So we are trying to identify a threshold where we will get uh, acceptable seedling growth rates, but also not um, identify areas that are otherwise uh, too hot or, or dry for white bark pine to grow. And so this is what one plausible future of the planting landscape might look like based on this AET threshold. So this is using a threshold of 250 millimeters, which is where that AET curve levels off. Um, but by choosing a threshold like this, we avoid that area of declining production and achieve at least a, you know, an average level of white bark pine establishment. And um, this is one case where a warming climate actually helps our projections of where a plant white bark pine because AET is a function of, among other things, temperature. And so what we see in these projections is uh, as the climate is projected to warm into the future, we see a creeping up of areas that meet this threshold into higher elevation areas. Um, and what's interesting about these projections to me is that white bark pine is a high elevation species and we may be tempted to plant seedlings in high elevation areas. However, it may, they may not be very productive in high elevation areas, and it may take them an extremely long time to establish. So by identifying areas that are highly productive, we may need to look at mid to high elevations instead of just purely the highest elevations where it's likely to dominate the landscape now. So avoiding severe drought into the future is also very important for successful plantings. Uh, drought impacts can be especially severe for seedlings. Uh, and while, um, while direct evidence of drought cause mortality is lacking for white bark pine in the GYE, it's still in our interest to, to choose areas that are likely to avoid drought uh, in order to have successful seedling growth and establishment. And the measure we're using to indicate drought is climatic water deficit which is a measure of the evaporative demand on the landscape that's not met by available water. So this is sort of a counterpart to AET, where AET is, is magnitude of uh, magnitude and length of favorable conditions for plants. CWD is, is a measure of the magnitude of drought. And the measure we're working with is the, or the threshold rather, that we're working with is the uh, annual climatic water deficit that the GYE experienced in the 1988 droughts, which led to severe, severe wildfire, uh, the worst wildfires in the park in recorded history. And um, in 1988, the park experienced an average annual climatic water deficit of 110 millimeters. Uh, and I do hope to improve this measure. It's I, I would like to identify physiological uh, based thresholds of drought tolerance of white bark pine that I can project into the future using these, these climate projections. Um, but as a baseline, this, this is what we are starting with. And so using that threshold, these are areas that are on average likely to avoid uh, severe drought as indicated by the 1988 um, drought experience in, in Yellowstone. Um, and so as the climate warms and dries in the future, or rather is project projected to warm and dry, 
we see a shrinking of areas that are unlikely to experience severe drought into mostly high elevation areas. So in a way, sort of a counterpart to the AET projections, which expand on the landscape, the drought projections shrink to higher elevations. So whitebark pine has a rather complicated relationship with wildfire. Um, and historically, wildfire has been a major player in whitebark pine's ability to regenerate on the landscape by clearing out competing vegetation and uh, allowing whitebark to, to get a foothold. Uh, however, if we're planting seedlings and we want them to survive the 50 plus years that's necessary to begin bearing cones, we do want to avoid areas that are likely to burn, at least in the near future. And the, the fire model I'm working with is based on efforts by my advisor, David Toma, to model fire ignition uh, in the in the greater in the sorry, Great Sand Dunes National Park in the Southern Rockies. Um, and he developed this model using the monitoring trends and burn severity wildfire database, which is a uh, continental United States wide model of large wildfire ignitions, and it gives uh, an incredible amount of data on these ignitions. And he used DayMet as his historical climate data source. And he looked at rolling sums of and rolling means of water balance and climate variables. And by doing that, he hoped to develop measures of accumulated fire danger and not and the, the, the reasoning behind this is that it may not be dryness on one day that's sufficient to allow for fire ignition, but rather the dryness needs to accumulate over time. And he found that the water balance measure climatic water deficit um, summed over a 14 day period on the day of ignition was the best predictor of historical ignitions in the Southern Rockies. And what this model tells us effectively is is the landscape dry enough to burn? It doesn't tell us anything about the magnitude or severity of fires that do occur on the landscape, but it tells us if conditions are dry enough that to allow a wildfire to ignite. And so we, we were curious if this model would also hold in the Middle Rockies ecoregion, which is uh, where the GYE is located. And so I reran his model on um, MTVS data from the Middle Rockies. And I use GridMet historical climate data for this because our, our climate projections are based on GridMet and using GridMet as the historical climate data allows us to make um, continuous, it allows the projections to be continuous with the historical data. And it, it allows us to make these projections without bias correcting any of the climate data. And um, the water balance data came from Mike Tursik's MPS gridded water balance data set, which is also based on GridMet. And another question I wanted to test here was re whether the 14 day rolling window that David found in the Southern Rockies was optimal. And I tested a, a variety of rolling windows from a single day, which is effectively the instantaneous uh, climate on that day of ignition up to about a month. And I compared models using the receiver operating characteristic, uh, the curves, which is a an indicator of the trade-offs between model sensitivity and sel selectivity. Uh, so as you increase the threshold for for a classifying a positive ignition, um, it tells you uh, what the the true trade-off would be. And when you plot these curves, the one-to-one -one line in the middle is effectively what a random classifier would get. So um, things that are below this line are effectively uh, worse than randomly assigning positive or negatives for fire ignitions. The things that are above it are considered better um, by the ranking that this gives. And What's interesting is how much better these water balance variables perform than simple measures of climate like rain um, and we see that CWD and BPD perform very similarly with CWD getting a slight edge um, and really beat out other measurements such as rain. And um, this is this really is more evidence for the strength of water balance approach for, for measuring the biophysical environment as it is experienced by plants. And 
of the, the various rolling windows that I tested, I found about a week uh, rolling sum for uh, most climate measures was the best. And with a seven day rolling sum of climatic water deficit performing the best out of all models tested. And because we can calculate CWD from temperature and precipitation data, which is collected by, uh, by weather stations in almost real time, we can use this, um, this model as, as a real time fire ignition danger forecasting system. And there's my collaborators, Mike Tursik and Kirk Sherrill from the National Park Service have created dashboards for uh, great sand dunes and fluorescent fossil beds in the Southern Rockies using real-time weather station data to develop real-time projections of um, fire ignition danger. And also have developed short-term and long-term forecasts, which are also available on that website. So this is kind of a cool application of this that's outside of my project. So historically, mountain pine beetles have been a major driver of whitebark pine mortality. Uh, they have wiped out vast areas of whitebark pine and indeed other conifer species on the landscape. And they, what mountain pine beetle outbreaks can be driven by climate. So they require a sufficient amount of temperature to accum accumulate it over their life cycle to fully develop. And Typically in the GYE, in the areas we're looking at, mountain pine beetles populations are semi-voltine. And this means that they require over one life, over one year to complete their life cycle. So it, you may get, um, so it may take a year and a half or two years for a beetle larvae to fully uh, mature and emerge and then uh, begin to spread, spread its, you know, its larvae around the landscape. And with sufficient accumulated temperature, they can achieve univoltinism, which is when they're able to complete one life cycle per year. And um, there's evidence that this 833 degree day threshold, which is when they're able to achieve univoltinism, is responsible for uh, severe epidemic outbreaks of mountain pine beetle in the GYE. So if I can direct your attention to the blue uh, blue dotted line and the blue line on this graph, it shows a time series of accumulated growing degree days in the GYE. And this uh, black line at 2009 was the year that some very severe mountain pine beetle caused mortality was observed in white bark pine in the GYE. And over the history of this time series, there were several days, several years rather, where growing degree days exceeded this threshold for univoltinism, but there wasn't necessarily a severe outbreak that was noted following it. But preceding the 2009 um, outbreak of mountain pine beetle, there were several years, mostly in sequence, where uh, the 833 degree day threshold was exceeded. So we believe that uh, this by exceeding this threshold for multiple years, mountain pine beetle populations were able to achieve uh, really large numbers, and and this was responsible for for the severe outbreak and mortality of white bark pine. And so I modeled this um, univoltinism threshold on the landscape using temperature projections, and um, and these are what these projections might look like out to the end of the century. So currently there are large areas of white bark pines range where these beetle populations are likely to stay below univoltine. And it's really at the lower elevations uh, around the edge of the uh, current distribution of white bark pine where we see the potential for univoltinism in mountain pine beetles. And of course, as the climate warms, we're gonna, we're projected to see many more years where we will exceed this univoltinism threshold. And unfortunately, it seems like uh, there's going to be large areas of the landscape where there is potential for univoltinism and potential for uh, white bark pine, severe amount of pine beetle cause mortality of white bark pine and other conifer trees. Um, and we see in some areas like the Grand Tetons almost complete uh, 
almost the entire area exceeds this threshold. And we can we may project based on these um, this these data that these areas will see severe amount of pine beetle outbreak, whereas other areas like the Wind River Range and high elevations may be more sheltered from the effects of mountain pine and beetle. And so we're also interested in modeling the white pine blister rust infection hazard for the seedlings we plant on the landscape. Uh, in recent history, white pine blister rust has become one of the predominant drivers of white bark pine mortality on the landscape. And this is one, in, this is one instance of a layer where I'm actually trying to uh, make projections outside of the GYE. So uh, I'm starting with these GYE, white pine blister rust infection hazard models that um, my advisor, David Toma, and some collaborators developed. And they looked at August, September climate, which is basidio spore transmission season. So as many of us probably know, white pine blister rust has a very complicated life cycle with I think about five different spore stages and they each affect different hosts and have different um, distances they can transmit and, and um, ability to survive on the landscape for different amounts of time. But the basidio spores, which are transmitted in late summer are the ones that affect white bark pine. So we thought by modeling these conditions in late summer that we are really getting to the, the crux of the time of year that blister rust is able to, to infect white bark pine. And, um, and we hope to, to use that to, to identify areas of, of the, the landscape where the climate avoids its possibility for transmission to, to white bark pine. And so this GYE model, again, used historical data from DAMET uh, and, and looking at August, September climate and water balance variables based off DAMET data, they found that probability of white bark pine infection was best predicted by uh, diameter of breast height of the trees and August, September temperature and relative humidity and their interactions. Um, so nothing incredibly surprising in that we, we, we would expect hot, you know, humid temperatures, uh, uh, humid climates rather to promote fungal infections by allowing the spores to germinate. Um, but we were interested uh, in knowing if this relationship also held range-wide. And uh, thanks to the efforts of EJ and David and Aaron Shanahan and others, uh, we accumulated a really large data set of tree-level data, uh, including variables such as DVH and white pine blister rust status, among other things. And this data is accumulated from various National Park Service INM networks, as well as BLM and Forest Service partners. And we also had some Canadian partners who were kind enough to share their data with us. And we assembled nearly a representative um, array of data around White Bark Pines range, although there are still some gaps in it in areas such as central Idaho and um, some areas on the West Coast and Northwest Canada. And we are in the process of collecting more data from people who are kind enough to share it um, to fill in some of these gaps. And um, preliminary work that was done on this by EJ, Elizabeth Jameson, found better results even in local projections or predictions rather when we, when we use this range-wide data set over the GY data set. And our thinking is, by modeling one region, such as the GYE, we're not fully capturing the range of climates that the GYE, for example, may experience in the future. Um, so by modeling conditions across white bark pines range, we're able to capture that full range of environmental conditions that it currently experiences, and hopefully the environmental conditions that many of these regions will um, transfer to as the climate changes. And again, this was a, um, a climate model that I had to rerun using GridMet in order to take advantage of the projections that we wanted to make. And we ran across one really unfortunate issue right at the start, which is that GridMet doesn't cover below the 49th parallel. So it, it effectively cut us off from using the Canadian data points, at least if we want to develop a model to um, project with the future climate in this way. And this is something we're still trying to figure out if there is a solution to. 
um, or if this model will just have to be limited to the continental United States. Um, but this was really unfortunate and uh, we really would like to be able to use this Canadian data and make projections in, in the Canadian range since people were so kind enough to, to share the data with us. And so I fit a series of spatial explicit logistic regression models um, based on the 2000 to 2020 climate normals uh, using these data points, at least for the continental United States. And I tested a variety of um, climate variables, including um, BPD, relative humidity, precipitation, temperature. And one, one question we were interested in, in seeing was if there was a difference between relative humidity and BPD in the performance of these models, um, since a lot of recent work on blister rust um, identified BPD as a top performer. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, at least on this CONUS-wide data set, um, I found that probability of infection was best predicted by August, September temperature and precipitation um, and their interactions. And um, BPD, I mean, uh, excuse me, precipitation and relative humidity performed very similarly, but uh, pre precipitation, at least as measured by AIC, was a slightly better performing model. So at least for these preliminary projections, I'm going to show this is this is what we're working with. And um, precipitation and relative humidity are just different kinds of wetness. So it's not super surprising that they both perform well. Um, but at least on the scale we're looking at, which is around 20 years of, of climate, um, precipitation performs better. And it may be that if, if we had the data to do uh, a, a much higher resolution of temporal analysis here, so if we were able, the, the, the issue with many of these monitoring data sets is that they only visit the trees every couple of years. So um, trying to identify the actual date of infection is nearly impossible with the data that's available. So we, we, our question was more about what is the regional climate that predicts infection and not uh, what is the environmental conditions at time of infection. So at least at that larger scale, rainy climates predict blister rust infection better than, than humid climates. Um, but we got really good uh, skill with this model um, based on eightfold cross-validation. Um, we see around 83.8% model accuracy, which is um, which is really good. And uh, we hope that it will, it will able, enable us to accurately identify locations of high blister rust hazard into the future. And so this is what the fixed effects for this model, August, September temperature precipitation look like. Um, so like, uh, um, so so like the original findings in the GYE model, we see really actually really similar patterns, uh, just that we re replace precipitation with relative humidity. Uh, so we see, um, as is kind of commonly known that larger trees are more likely to be infected by blister rust and that seedlings, smaller trees are have lower rates of infection. And we see generally as the climate warms and gets more rainy, uh, infection rates go up. Um, but it's interesting when you look at the interactions between temperature and precipitation, you see this kind of Goldilocks disease thing that uh, Aaron Shanahan has called it, where uh, it seems to really like a specific level of temperature and, and wetness to, to really cause severe infection. And at low to moderate temperatures, you see increasing rates of infection as precipitation increases. But at, um, at higher temperatures, such as around 14 degrees Celsius, average August, September temperatures, um, you actually see the highest rates of infection in drier climates. So, um, the model selection process seemed to really strongly indicate that we should include uh, this interaction, and it's it's interesting uh, to see these patterns. And this this mimics very strongly what David Toma and others found with relative humidity, where um, uh, 
at low temperatures, you saw increasing relationship of infection and relative humidity, but at higher temperatures, it tended to decrease. And so this is what one plausible future of the um, infection hazard for blister rust might look like across um, both the entire range of white bark pine, as well as just in the GYE. And um, this is extremely work in progress work, but um, I, I do think we're starting to see some really interesting um, geographic patterns appear based on this model. So um, in a lot of the uh, Cascades and, and Western West Coast mountains, you see these interesting geographic patterns where um, on the Western slopes of the mountains, we have lower rates of infection. And then on the Eastern slopes, much higher rates of infection. Um, and also some very uh, strong spatial patterns appearing in, in Idaho, um, where the higher elevation areas seem to be more sheltered from the disease than lower elevation areas where, where white bark pine has historically inhabited. Um, and then in the GYE, um, we do see some uh, evidence of areas that, that will be sheltered from blister rust infection in the future. So um, these projections also, I forgot to say, are for mature trees around 33 centimeter diameter breast height. So um, we would expect these trees to have the highest levels of infection. Um, and this makes me actually rather hopeful because even it seems like in uh, you know, worse, worst case scenarios that there are still a lot of areas where um, we can expect trees to be sheltered from infection. And um, when I develop these projections for seedlings, I would expect low, generally lower levels of infection rates across the landscape. And so my work here is not close to done, um, aside from needing to tweak the these layers that I produced so far. Uh, I would like to produce a layer predicting um, suitability or climate promoting cone production. And we have the interagency grizzly bear study team monitoring data to work with here. Um, and then our, our final product we're hoping to produce is some kind of user-friendly tool to explore this data, these data rather, and to make management decisions. And we're hoping to build some kind of web dashboard um, that will allow users to tweak these parameters and, and um, really make their own decisions on what risk level they're willing to tolerate for each of these, these factors uh, and climate drivers of various critical life stages of white bark pine. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening to my talk and um, I'll take any questions that anyone has. Thank you so much, Stephen, for that talk. Um, I see a couple, or I see a question in the chat um, that I can read out loud, and then we can address any questions. If anybody wants to raise their hand virtually, um, then Enzo can unmute you, or otherwise you're welcome to put your question in the chat and I will read it out to Stephen. Um, okay, so the first question I see in the chat from Ben um, is wondering if you evaluated summer vapor pressure deficit in the model. Um, it seems the physiological connections are stronger than relative humidity, and he's wondering how the model performance compared. Uh, yeah, thank you, Ben. Um, that, the question was about if we evaluated vapor pressure deficit in our white pine blister rust model. And that was one of the questions um, we were looking to answer was how vapor pressure deficit compared to relative humidity. Um, a lot of recent research uh, found that vapor pressure deficit performed the best in their, in their climatic analysis of white pine blister rust. Um, and it's not something that the original GYE model that I'm, I'm basing this work off of looked at. And Interestingly enough, we, we did look at it and um, it did not perform as well as relative humidity uh, in general. And it kind of depended on um, whether you're looking at first or second order uh, versions of these climate variables and their, their interactions. Um, but we were, we, were, we were interested to see that it seemed like relative humidity is a better predictor 
of white pine blister rust infection. And, and we think it might have something to do with the, the different um, roles that these variables play in uh, plant growth and fungal infection. And um, the way we're thinking about it is that vapor pressure deficit creates conditions that promote stomatal opening and, and allow fungal spores to enter the plants and, and allow that infection to happen themselves, whereas relative humidity um, creates like environmental conditions that promote fungal spore germination and survival. And um, whatever the reason is, at least at the, the scales we we're looking at, uh, we, we found that relative humidity performs slightly better than BPD. But yeah, thank you. Great, thanks Stephen for answering that question. Um, the second question I see in the chat is Kathy wondering how you are planning on linking or considering infection risk versus mortality as a function of DBH for your range-wide models um, and how that will be used to inform management actions. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. Um, so for my primary question, which is where should we plant seedlings on the landscape, I'm mostly interested in smaller DBHs. Um, so at least for my final product, I'm probably only going to look at smaller DBH trees, but um, I do hope that by uh, modeling blister rust infection as a function of DBH that people are interested in questions like um, where existing stands will tend to survive or avoid blister rust infection, that they, they can use these models um, to, to do that. And um, so it's, it's kind of, Hopefully we'll be able to answer questions about all sorts of size classes as trees, but specifically I'm mostly interested in seedlings. And also if you're, we're not really modeling mortality and that's something I'm interested in sort of incorporating in these models. I, there was recently um, Richard Sneezko, I, I, I probably butchered his name, but he, he published uh, some, some work on the genetic resistance to blister rust and found that there is a, a first of all a great deal of blister rust genetic res, blister rust resistance in white bark pine which is great news but that um, tree mortality varies a lot based on genetic resistance so um, I'm modeling blister rust hazard here but I really am interested in incorporating that kind of information into these models um, to say okay well if you're planting highly resistant trees versus moderately resistant trees where are they um, most likely to survive infection if they are infected. But yeah, thanks for the question, Kat. Um, Great. Thanks again, Stephen, for answering that question. The next question I see in the chat um, is Alina wondering if you have considered using Terra climate data to have cross range climate data. Yeah, thanks, Alina. I did look at Terra Climate, and originally we were interested in uh, comparing a lot of these other variables like BPD and relative humidity, which it could be mistaken, but I believe Terra Climate only provides temperature and precip data. Um, so we kind of ruled it out. I mean, it would be great because it would, it would let us get Canada. But after the findings of this model, at least with uh, GridMet climate data, since we, we end up using temperature, Anyway, maybe Terra Climate would be a good option. Uh, that's something I have thought about recently. It, it would be really great to get Canada into these models. Um, and uh, but what I what I have found is that with these different climate data sets, you do get a lot of differences in, in variable importance. So um, we wouldn't be able to test with Terra Climate's data if like Terra Climate modeled precip would be better than relative humidity, um, unfortunately. So we'd be assuming it has the same relationship with grid met, but that's something I have found a lot with going from like day met data, which a lot of the previous work's been, been uh, made with to grid met is that you get slightly different variable importance. Um, but anyway, yes. Yeah, so, so now that temperature and precip seem to be the top performer, um, that might kind of pave the way to just use Terra climate, which would get us Canada. But uh, thanks for bringing that up. Great. Um, Stephen, I see another question in the chat wondering about 
Um, a lot of these same precipitation and humidity and temperature variables also drive fire severity risk and wondering if there are any trade-off in terms of replanting strategy between blister risk and fire loss risk. Yeah, it's an interesting question. And we're not really looking at the interactions of these things. Like there's a lot of simulation work that's being done that kind of tries to account for the interactions of wildfire and amount of pine beetle and blister rust. And um, what's kind of nice about this work is we can, we're kind of assuming a blank slate on the landscape. And if, you know, let's say there's, there's no vegetation there, we plant a white bark pine seedling, you know, where is it likely to avoid these disturbance agents? So we're not really considering interactions per se. But when we do take the, the the spatial union or intersection rather of these various raster layers, um, I do expect to see, um, you know, I expect that to account for some of these trade-offs where, if, um, you know, the, the the climate promotes blister rust, but low fire in one area, but and, and vice versa in another that they'll kind of get excluded from um, our like recommended areas based on this this data. Um, but yeah, it's a very good question and it, it, you know, it'd be nice to, it, you know, for some of these things, I know Mount of Pine Beetle also has interactions with drought. So, um, it would be great to have some ways to kind of account for interactions between these effects. Uh, thanks for your question. Great. Thanks, Stephen. Um, oh, great. Another question. Oh, more so just a comment. If anybody has any other questions, feel free to type them into the chat so that I can read them out loud, or you can virtually raise your hand um, and then Enzo can enable you to use your microphone. So I'll give it a couple moments to see if anybody has any other questions for Steven. Yeah, and I see a lot of comments from John Van Gundy. Um, I'll have to read through them and, um, you know, it might be great to talk some time outside of this on your thinking for a, a, a way of blister us vulnerability map. Great. Um, if anybody wants to um, connect with Stephen, we'll go ahead and send Stephen the chat so that he has a record of questions and comments. Um, but thank you so much, Stephen, for taking some time to present at the webinar today. Our next webinar will be on December 19th um, with Dr. Sarah Goking, who will be presenting her work on broad scale evaluation of whitebark pine status and trends using past and current applications of forest inventory and analysis data. And thank you all again for attending, and we hope to see you all next month. Thanks a lot, everybody.